Welcome everybody to the reading of The Moral Logic of Survivor Guilt by Nancy Sherman. This is an anchor text in your Volume 1 English textbook. We will be using this article in support for the argument essay at the end of this unit. The question is, should people in life or death situations be held accountable for their actions? Again, this article will be used as one of the pieces of evidence for you staking your claim, yes or no, that people are being held accountable for their actions. I'm going to read this and pause and direct you to underline and highlight sections of the text. So you will need a pen or pencil. You will also need the textbook in front of you. So you can pause this video and get the required implements before we begin. Background. Traumatic events take a toll on the physical and mental well-being of the individuals who must endure them. Survivors of the Holocaust, rescue workers, and war veterans, for example, might wonder how they were able to make it out alive when others did not. The term survivor guilt is used to describe these feelings. If there is one thing we have learned from returning war veterans, especially those in the last decade, it's that the emotional reality of the soldier at home is often at odds with that of the civilian public they left behind. And while friends and families of returning service members may be experiencing gratefulness or relief this holiday, many of those they've welcomed home are likely struggling with other emotions. I would like to direct you to the bottom of this page. Notice that the little one at the end of holiday is connected down at the bottom of page 153, where it says this holiday. This essay was originally published the day before the 4th of July. All right, so pay attention to those little footnotes. They give you greater information. All right, moving on to the next section. Is this sense of responsibility soldiers feel toward each other irrational? What does irrational mean? Irrational means that it's not logical, that it doesn't make sense. So we're going to be exploring that question. High on that list of emotions is guilt. Soldiers often carry this burden home, survivor guilt being perhaps the kind most familiar to us. In war, standing here rather than there can save your life, but cost a buddy his. It's flukish luck, but you feel responsible. The guilt begins an endless loop of counterfactuals thoughts that you could have or should have done otherwise, though in fact you did nothing wrong. The feelings are, of course, not restricted to the battlefield. But given the magnitude of loss and war, they hang heavy there and are pervasive, and they raise the question of just how irrational those feelings are, and if they aren't, of what is the basis of their reasonableness. I want to look at a couple of the vocabulary words in this section. The first one, if you would please, is circle the word burden. Over here on the right hand side, it tells you something that is carried with difficulty or with obligation. So a burden is something that, in this sense, that somebody feels on an emotional level, like some sort of, you know, responsibility or that they're caring for someone else or for a situation and it kind of weighs them down might make them feel bad so that's what that means and counterfactuals notice that there is an m dash or a line right after the word counterfactuals that indicates you are being given a definition about that word after the word so counterfactuals are thoughts that you have excuse me Thoughts that you could have or should have done otherwise. Something that you should have or could have done, but really what you did, there was nothing wrong with what you did. The outcome was just almost unbearable. So that's what we mean by counterfactuals. And when we have another little footnote, uh, a number two, by the next to the word magnitude, and that means of great size or extent. So, but in the sentence then, but given the magnitude of loss in war, that means the great or huge loss of life, particularly in war. So that's, those are 
some of the definitions of the words that are there. I want you to pause right now, and if you would, please write a quick summary of paragraphs one and two, squeeze it in over there on that little section at the bottom of page 153. As we move to the next page, 154, I want you to take notice that we have a definition of the word culpability, so we will be working with that word, and conscience and more, uh, remorse. So those are the three vocabulary words that we're going to be dealing with on this page. They're in blue. And we also at the bottom, we have directions for a close read where we will be annotating paragraph six and answering a question and drawing a conclusion. So those things are going to be happening on page 154. Please have your pen or pencil ready to write on your textbook. If you don't have a textbook, uh, write it on a separate piece of paper, if you will. All right, starting at the top with paragraph three. Captain Adrian Bonenberger, head of a unit in Afghanistan, pondered those questions recently as he thought about specialist Jeremiah Pulaski, who was killed by police in the wake of a deadly bar fight shortly after his return home. Back in Afghanistan, Pulaski had saved Bonenberger's life twice on one day. But when Pulaski needed help, Bonenberger couldn't be there for him. When he was in trouble, he was alone, Captain Bonenberger said. When we were in trouble, he was there for us. I know it's not rational or reasonable. There's nothing logical about it. But I feel responsible. But how reasonable is that feeling? Subjective guilt associated with this sense of responsibility is thought to be irrational because one feels guilty despite the fact that he knows he has done nothing wrong. Objective or rational guilt, by contrast, guilt that is fitting to one's action, accurately tracks real wrongdoing or culpability. Let's pause for a second and look at culpability. Culpability means guilt or blame that is deserved, blameworthiness. So if you get in your car and you're drunk driving and you hurt somebody, that means that you should feel guilty because you're not supposed to be drunk driving. It was literally something that could have been avoided, that you literally could have done something differently, as in chose not to drink. Uh, and get behind the wheel of a car. So that's what we mean by culpability. You you really are responsible for what it is that you did because it could have been, you could have made a different decision, but you chose not to. So let's go back and look at that. Accurately tracks real wrongdoing or culpability. Guilt is appropriate because one acted to deliberately harm someone or could have prevented harm and did not. Blameworthiness here depends on the idea that a person could have done something other than what he did, and so he is held responsible or accountable by himself or others. I'd like you to pause the video right now, and if you will, over on the notes section in the left-hand column, if you would please write a brief summary of paragraph 3 and 4. Okay, moving on to paragraph 5. But as Bonenberger's remarks make clear, we often take responsibility in a way that goes beyond what we can reasonably be held responsible for, and we feel the guilt that comes with that sense of responsibility. Nietzsche is the modern philosopher who well understood this phenomenon. Das schlechte Gewissen, literally meaning bad conscience. His term for the consciousness of guilt where one has done no wrong doesn't grow in the soil where we should most expect it, he argued, such as in prisons where they are actually guilty, parties who should feel remorse for wrongdoing. In the genealogy of morals, he appeals to an earlier philosopher, Spinoza, for support. The bite of conscience, writes Spinoza in The Ethics, has to do with an offense where something has gone unexpectedly wrong. As Nietzsche adds, it is not really a case of I ought not to have done that. So let's go back and look at this paragraph. Again, we have another word in blue, bad conscience. Look over there on the left. Conscience is the inner sense of what is morally right or wrong in one's action. And to feel guilty, if you would please go and underline that part where 
of the first sentence, we often take responsibility in a way that goes beyond what we can reasonably be held accountable for. And then also underline, we feel the guilt that comes with that sense of responsibility. So oftentimes people feel guilty for things that have gone wrong um, that they had no control of, but we take that responsibility on and we, we feel the guilt of whatever bad happened, even if it was something that we, we couldn't help or stop. And Nietzsche is saying that this bad conscience is where we feel guilty. So underline this part, the consciousness of guilt where one has done no wrong. Okay, so underline that. So people feel guilty even when they haven't done anything wrong and you would expect that level of guilt to be seen in places like prisons where people are actually guilty of something that they have done where they should feel remorse for their wrongdoing. But sometimes and most often they do not. So remorse, that's another blue word if you will go over here to the left, means a deep sense of regret for having done wrong. All right, so if you would, please go over to the side and write just a brief little summary of what paragraph five was about. Okay, we are ready to move on to paragraph number six. Again, we will be annotating this section specifically. But what then is it a case of? Part of the reasonableness of survivor guilt, and in a sense its fittingness, is that it tracks a moral significance that is broader than moral action. Who am I in terms of my character and relationships and not just what I do matters morally? If you would please go and underline the term moral action and if you would underline that following sentence, who I am in terms of my character and relationships and not just what I do matters morally. Of course, character is expressed in action, and when we don't walk the walk, we are lacking, but it is also expressed in emotions and attitudes. Aristotle, in his Nicomachean Ethics, insists on the point, virtue is concerned with emotions and actions. To have good character is to hit the mean with respect to both. Okay, what does that just mean? What does that mean? Walking the walk means I do what I say and I say what I do. A person's words and actions line up. And Aristotle is talking about virtue being concerned with your emotions and your actions. And to hit the mean means to strike a balance. Go ahead and look at, we have a little footnote there and next to Aristotle, the three. He was an ancient Greek philosopher and scientist. And we have number four, which is hit the mean, which means the middle point between two things. And in this case, to strike a balance between emotions and actions. Moreover, many of the feelings that express character are not about what one has done or should have done, but rather about what one cares deeply about. Although Aristotle himself doesn't talk about guilt. It is the emotion that best expresses that conflict, the desire or obligation to help frustrated by the inability through no fault of one's own to do so. To not feel the guilt is to be numb to those pulls. It is that vulnerability that pulls that Bonenberger feels when he says he wasn't there for Pulaski when he needed him. So let's consider that story for a second. For a second and what it means to the section that we're reading. So the guilt is off, often comes out of the desire or the feeling of obligation that somebody has toward an individual or situation and they're frustrated because they were not able to help. In this case, right, one man wasn't physically in the vicinity for the other. He wasn't standing next to him uh, in the bar room, it's like, you know, if an accident happens to somebody in your family and you were at work or you were at school, you weren't there to actually help, yet you feel guilty as if you should have been or could have done something. So there is a tremendous amount of guilt, even though you technically and really didn't do anything wrong. 
All right, if you would pause right now and please write a little summary of paragraph six. All right, we are now moving on to page 155 and you'll notice we have two vocabulary words in this section, entrusted and empathetic. We'll be pausing to discuss those when we get to them. Next section. The sacred bond among soldiers originates not just in duty, but in love. In many of the interviews I've conducted with soldiers over the years, feelings of guilt and responsibility tangle with feelings of having betrayed fellow soldiers. At stake is the duty to those soldiers, the imperative to hold intact the bond that enables them to fight for and with each other in a kind of sacred band that the ancients memorialized and that the marine motto Semper Fidelis captures so well. But it is not just duty at work, it is love. I want to direct you to the footnote, the five next to imperative, go down to the bottom. Imperative means to act, the act or duty that is important or required. So it's important or required to hold intact or hold together the bond between the soldiers because that is what allows them to fight with and for each other and that they form a sacred band or a, a brotherhood or a group that cannot be unbound. And this is embodied in the marine motto, Semper Fidelis, which is number six. If you look down, you see how to pronounce that, Semper Fidelis. It's Latin for always faithful. Okay, so then that's the number six. So this bond then enables and is required that soldiers have a sense of faithfulness to each other and to their mission. And um, this is the way that they can feel safe and do what they need to do. And it is not just duty at work, it is love. All right, moving on to paragraph eight. Service members, especially those higher in rank, routinely talk about unit members as my soldiers, my Marines, my sailors. They are family members, their own children of sorts, who have been entrusted to them. To fall short of unconditional care is experienced as a kind of perfidy, a failure to be faithful. Survivor guilt piles on the unconscious thought that luck is part of a zero-sum game. To have good luck is to deprive another of it. The anguish of guilt, its sheer pain, is a way of sharing some of the ill fate. It is a form of empathetic distress. So let's go back and look at the word entrusted. Entrusted means over here on the right, given the responsibility of doing something or caring for someone or something. So someone entrusts you. Higher ranking officers feel that the family members of their soldiers or their Marines or their sailors have, they've entrusted them the, a mother or father is trusting that the commanding officer is going to take care of their son or daughter as they are serving under them. So they are given and trusted with their care. Empathetic means over here characterized by empathy, the ability to identify with the feelings or thoughts of others. So when something bad happens to a unit member or a soldier underneath the higher ranking officer, that feeling guilty and the pain of carrying that guilt is a way of the commanding officer to share in the grief and distress of family members who have lost their soldier. So I'd like to pause at this point and if you would please write a summary on the right hand column, squeeze it in from paragraphs seven and eight. All right, we are starting with paragraph nine. Many philosophers have looked to other terms to define the feeling. What they have come up with is agent regret, a term coined by the British philosopher Bernard Williams, but used by many others. The classic scenario is not as much one of good luck as in survivor guilt, but of bad luck typically having to do with accidents where, again, there is little or no culpability for the harms caused. 
In these cases, people may be causally responsible for harm, meaning they bring about the harm through their agency, but they are not morally responsible for what happened. But to my ear, agent regret is simply tone deaf to how subjective guilt feels. Despite the insertion of agent, it sounds as passive and flat as regretting that the weather is bad, or more tellingly, as removed from empathetic distress as the message sent to the next of kin after an official knock on the door, the Secretary of Defense regrets to inform you that. Let's pause for a second because there's a lot of complicated ideas in here. So we have this new term called agent regret, and that is where somebody causes some bad things to happen, but they don't take more responsibility for what happened. For example, oh, I, I, I may have caused this accident, but it wasn't really my fault. Um, and therefore, I don't really feel bad about having run over your dog or your cat, something like that. I can't be responsible for that because your cat darted out, you know, and I don't really feel bad. So that it releases the, it releases the feelings of guilt through this agent regret. So they are not morally responsible for what happened. Paragraph 10 is talking about how this term of removing the guilt and removing that moral responsibility sounds like flat and passive. So underline that. Those are good words, passive and flat. And he says it's sort of like when a soldier is killed in the line of duty that the, the letter goes out and, and somebody knocks on the door and says, the Secretary of Defense regrets to inform you that. And um, look down at the little footnote there. The, it's the first sentence of a scripted message spoken by United States military officers when they report the death of a soldier to the soldier's closing, closest living relative. So it sounds rather flat. It doesn't sound very empathetic or very heartfelt or very genuine. So that's what that's talking about. All right, if you would go ahead and pause and write a summary for paragraphs 9 and 10 in the side margin. Indeed, the soldiers I've talked to involved in friendly fire accidents that took their comrades' lives didn't feel regret for what happened, but raw, deep, unabashed guilt. And the guilt persisted long after they were formally investigated and ultimately exonerated. In one wrenching case in April 2003 in Iraq, the gun on a Bradley fighting vehicle misfired, blowing off most of the face of Private Joseph Mayick, who was standing guard near the vehicle. The accident was ultimately traced to a faulty replacement battery that the commander in charge had authorized. When the Bradley's ignition was turned on, the replacement battery in the turret, a Marine battery rather than an Army one, failed to shut off current to the gun. Mayek, who was 20, died. The Army officer in charge, then Captain John Pryor, reconstructed the ghastly scene for me and the failed attempts in the medic tent to save Mayek's life. He then turned to his feelings of responsibility. I'm the one who placed the vehicles. I'm the one who set the security. As with most accidents, I'm not in jail right now. Clearly, I wasn't egregiously responsible, but it is a comedy of errors. Any one of a dozen decisions made over the course of a two-month period, and none of them really occurs to you at the time, any one of those made differently may have saved his life. So I dealt with and still deal with the guilt of having cost him his life, essentially. There's probably not a day that goes by that I don't think about it, at least fleetingly. Fleetingly means at, at least for a moment I think about it. Let's pause right now and write a summary of 11 and 12, specifically focusing on this event that happened to Private Joseph Mayick and Captain John Pryor's feelings of responsibility. What Pryor feels are feelings of guilt and not simply regret that things didn't work out differently. He feels the awful weight of self-indictment, the empathy with the victim and survivors, and the need to make moral repair. 
If he didn't feel that, we would probably think less of him as a commander. We have another little footnote there. Indictment. Look down at number eight. An expression of strong disapproval toward oneself or self-blame. So he feels he blames himself tremendously. Next paragraph. In his case, moral repair came through an empathetic, painful connection with Mayek's mother. After the fratricide, Pryor and his first sergeant wrote a letter to Mayek's mother, and for some time after, she replied with care packages to the company and with letters. Oh, it was terrible, said Pryor. The letters weren't just very matter-of-fact. Here's what we did today. It was more like a mother writing to her son. Pryor had become the son who was no longer. It was her way of dealing with the grief, said Pryor, and so I had a responsibility to try and give back. In all this, we might say guilt, subjective guilt, has a redemptive side. It is a way that soldiers impose moral order on the chaos and awful randomness of war's violence. It is a way they humanize war for themselves, for their buddies, and for us as civilians, too. But if that's all that's involved, it sounds too moralistic. It makes guilt appropriate or fitting because it's good for society. It is the way we can all deal with war. Maybe instead we want to say it is fitting because it is evolutionarily adaptive in the way that fear is. But again, this doesn't do justice to the phenomena. The guilt that soldiers feel isn't just morally expedient or species adaptive. It is fitting because it gets right certain moral or evaluative features of a soldier's world that good soldiers depend on each other, come to love each other, and have duties to care and bring each other safely home. Philosophers, at least since the time of Kant, have called these imperfect duties. Even in the best circumstances, we can't perfectly fulfill them. And so, what duties to others need to make room for even in a soldier's life of service and sacrifice, are duties to self, of self-forgiveness and self-empathy. These are a part of full moral repair. All right, let's look at the little footnotes that we have. And we number nine is expedient, providing an easy way to do something, to do it quickly. And number 10, can't. Kant, Immanuel Kant, was a German philosopher who was a foremost thinker of the European Enlightenment, living a long time ago in the 1700s. All right, let's pause, and if you would, please write a brief little summary in the left-hand and right-hand margins of paragraphs 14, 15, 16. All right, now it is time to look at the comprehension check. There are four questions that you need to answer. Now it's time to open the Google document and to write your responses to the questions on page 157, 1, 2, 3, and 4. Also, go back to page 154 and answer the question and draw the conclusion in the margin from the close read. And the last section, on page 156, please answer the question and draw the conclusion from the close read in that section. And turn your Google document in when you are done. Thank you very much. Any questions, please direct them to your individual English teacher.